Previously on Bat. Marty would call this cinema. Is it a hot take to say that Batman Begins is, without a doubt, the best Batman movie in the trilogy? Not that The Dark Knight is a bad Batman movie. In fact, I think it's a much better film, but Batman Begins just feels like Batman to me, more Batman to me, most Batman to me, and that's in no small part thanks to the <laughs> filmmaking. But first, this video is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Manscaped has created the first all-in-one manscaping kit that makes manscaping safe and easy. Nobody wants to slice through their family jewels. It's painful, it hurts, and it's traumatizing. So traumatizing that you might grow up to become ball man or just let your guard down there turn into a fucking forest. Back in high school, I was preparing for a night where my dark night would rise, so I decided to trim the hedges, but instead... No. But instead, I trimmed Jeff. Jeff is my left testicle, and for the next year, I didn't touch Jeff. Jeff was left alone like Bruce in the alley, but no more! The Lawnmower 3.0 comes with a built-in light so you can see what you're doing, and it's water-resistant. You can even take it in the shower. But the number one feature is the advanced skincare technology. Sounds fancy, but it basically protects your balls from death by a thousand and cuts. Don't cut yourself. Instead, cut 20% off the price with code HIGHTOP20. You'll be protecting the old sack and helping support me and Jeff at the same time. Every time you trim, it will support the channel, so get trimming, boys. Batman Begins is Nolan's comic book movie. It's his only comic book movie. Batman Begins is very much a hero's journey. It's, it's an origin story. It's an origin myth, and so it has a sense of romanticism or theatricality that embraces that story model. The Dark Knight is a crime epic, and the Dark Knight rides is his war epic, but begins embraces all the showmanship and poeticism of the superhero film in a way that he avoids in the sequels. Batman Begins ain't afraid to have a suit up montage, or comic booky one liners, excuse me. or bits of over the top villainy. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a city to destroy. That comes with embracing the genre and embracing the Gotham City of the comic books. Gotham feels like Gotham and begins. It feels like hell and not Chicago. In a town that's been. Who's that a ride to anyway? The set design plays a massive part in that. The locations are crammed and crowded, gritty and grungy, somehow a hyper-stylized dystopia, but also entirely grounded in the forgotten burrows of our world. Nolan and his team built these massive sets. Production designer Nathan Crowley built Gotham in Chris's garage, and hundreds of talented people brought that Gotham to life. A living, breathing, rotting corpse of a city. There's so much Blade Runner in the Narrows. The pouring rain that never stops, and in that hellish downpour, a demon lurks, crouched in the shadows, soaring in the sky. Batman is scary here. Maybe the scariest he's ever been, visually, on film. The suit is big, bulky, intimidating, but never overly muscled. The stiffness in his movements feels like a deliberate choice and not a restriction. He feels almost animal-like, an aggressive panther waiting to pounce. An aggressive panther with a fucking tank. Can you believe the Tumblr was born from this crude model Christopher Nolan made and then a super cool model Nathan Crowley made in the garage? Can you believe that they built this thing? Like you can drive it down the damn highway or crash it through the highway, pancake police cars. God, I'd love to do that. I don't even drive. I also swear to God that so many people miss the pure comedy of that entire sequence. Stay calm. You've been poisoned. Come on, Nolan even finds a way to throw a burden reference in here. The dialogue in Batman Begins is extremely poetic, sometimes too poetic, sometimes to the point of parody. There are a lot of grand speeches, philosophies, and ideologies spewed out by characters in a way that no real human would ever speak. It's a trademark of a Nolan film, and we all love him for it, because he, most of the time, manages to make it work, sound as profound as he needs it to, by getting the best possible performers to deliver these Bits. Here's me saying, but I know the rage that drives you, the impossible anger strangling the grief until the memory of your loved one is just poison in your veins. And here's Liam Neeson saying, but I know the rage that drives you, that impossible anger strangling the grief until the memory of your loved one is just poison in your veins. See what I mean? Sometimes though, it doesn't work for me. Like when Bruce comes back to Gotham after being declared dead for seven years, comes back to see his childhood best friend, scratch that, his only freaking friend in years, and they manage to say all this. It's, it's not me. It's I. I am. I am more. Deep down, you may still be that same breaker you used to be. It's not who you are underneath. It's what you do that defines you.
that in the middle of some hotel lobby. It's efficient storytelling and a great way to force the audience to understand the themes and thoughts of your movie, but it lacks that realness, that honesty the rest of the film has. The character of Rachel, who is my major issue with all of these films, suffers the most from this. She's the anti-Andrea Beaumont. She's less a character and more a vessel for Nolan to explore his thoughts on Batman and Bruce Wayne. Your real face is the one that criminals now fear. Rachel has the potential to be this wonderful non-damsel in distress. A strong character in her own right and not just used as a symbol of Bruce's humanity, Bruce's last hope for a normal happy life, but instead be an actual human being and not a less interesting one-dimensional Jason Todd. <laughs> There's actually this weird thing with women in this movie, and I'm not trying to get like too fucking cancel culture about this, but Martha Wayne has one line that I can't even remember. What's wrong, Bruce? Oh, cool. And she's barely ever mentioned after she dies, whereas Bruce's father is mentioned. Is your father? It was your father. It was stronger than your father. You didn't know my father. No, Alfred, it's my father's house. Your father would be ashamed of you. He said your father begged for mercy. Your father nearly bankrupted your dad. Your father ran things. Yeah. You my father? It's your father's name. My father built it. father would be very proud of you. Yeah, I, I don't know what's up with that. Anyways, Christian Bale is so great here. Everyone is great. Everyone nails that dialogue. That is not easy to nail, but Bale gives his best performance as Bruce in this film. Maybe it's simply because he has a lot more to do, a lot more to hold up. The spotlight is very much on him, and because of that, we see how individualized and full of variety his performance is. We see Party Bruce, Rio Bruce, and Batman Bruce. Bale should have kept this damn voice. It's it's wonderful and has far more range than it does later on. Bruce can talk to Gordon and Rachel like this. Falcone sent them to kill you. But talk to Flash like Murder me! It sounds like a cold whisper full of razor blades here and here alone, not the aggressive, half asleep, drunk snarl of an animal. You'll be in a better jail forever. Maybe that was Nolan's point, Bale's intention, that as the movies and years went on, Batman became less and less of a man, more and more of that animal. Or maybe it was just something that wasn't focused on, thought about enough. But what matters here is that Bale carries this movie on his cape. If you couldn't believe that this man could become Batman, then no matter how great Nolan was behind the camera, Batman would never have began. Christian was the, the first actor I met with, actually. It was clear to me, looking into his eyes, that this is somebody who can make you believe in the possibility of somebody devoting their life to something this extreme. And let me make this clear. Nolan and his entire team are fantastic behind the camera. It's a Christopher Nolan Batman movie. That's all that really needs to be said. His movies are so damn solid, so filled with a unique premise, perspective, and personality, and they make damn good money. That's a rarity, a dying breed of filmmaker that can be number one at the box office and maintain his integrity and vision. And I think the major reason for that, the reason why you can buy into the somewhat self-indulgent and hammy dialogue is that there is no self-indulgence in the filmmaking, in the way he edits, in the way he directs, in the way he pieces his films together. Chrissy Boy never holds on a shot too long when he easily could. Wally Pfister's naturalistic but drenched in the shadows cinematography was rightfully nominated by the Academy. Nolan could hold on any of these shots and her eyes would be all the better for it, but he doesn't at all. The average shot in Batman Begins must be around three seconds or so, which could become, and in theory really should become, tiresome or headache inducing. But his films are so kinetically edited, so rhythmic that it never seems to bother me. And when he does hold on a shot for slightly longer than usual, we know how important the moment we are witnessing is, how immensely grand it feels, and we feel every emotion he wants us to feel, every emotion the character is feeling. He's almost superhuman in his ability to efficiently convey those emotions with simple shots, quick cuts, and strategically timed and paced editing. His style of shooting and editing almost always works, except for these goddamn fight scenes. <laughs> I get what Nolan is trying to do. Put us in a fight. Make us feel like we are in the fight alongside Bruce. But it really, really doesn't work.
I cannot tell you what just happened other than I got a migraine, passed out, and died like this madman stuntman should have when they sent him flying across this practically built Gotham set at 60 miles per hour while steam was exploding from the fucking earth. You guys know how much I love practical effects, practical stunts, exploding miniatures. I talk about it ad nauseum, but movies are magic. And there is always something magical about seeing extraordinary feats done by ordinary people, for real. And as you probably already know, Nolan is the modern day magician of doing just that. That I think capsulizes Chris's philosophy of filmmaking, which is let's do it for real. Let's put it down the way you would see it, you would believe it, and that That'll give us the kind of credibility to bring the audience in. But it's not as simple as what you see get thrown around out there. It's not as simple as Nolan hates CGI, so he split the truck for real, bro. He doesn't hate CGI. He uses plenty of CGI. The bats in this movie, the windows outside the train, the final shot of Batman. Christopher Nolan doesn't hate CGI. He doesn't hate visual effects. He just knows how to use it. I certainly never try to put any kind of visual effects restriction on the films. But my absolutist view of the way computer graphics works is that it's animation and so. So if it's created whole cloth and not manipulated from something that you've shot, whether it's live action or a miniature, there's always an understanding on the audience's part somewhere in the, in the subconscious that they're seeing a drawing, they're seeing animation as opposed to photography. He knows that in order to really grab and grip the audience, visual effects should be used sparingly, should be used to accent and elevate what he and his crew managed to do on the day, what they spent months dreaming of and planning in the garage. It gives Batman Begins this ultra tactile feel, much like his approach to Batman. It's less about not using CGI and more about conceiving bits of action that could really happen. You would never catch Nolan's Batman fighting Clayface. That would be awesome and amazing, but you really couldn't do that in a way the audience would 100% buy. But you can believe that Batman would need to call a swarm of bats to escape the SWAT team. You can believe that he would need to take down Falcone's goons at the docks. So why would you need to use heavy loads of VFX? The story doesn't require it. He limits himself, grounds himself, and the action sequences in the reality of the film. If Bruce Wayne builds himself a lair in a bat's cave, then why the hell shouldn't you really build a bat cave? If Batman is just a man, if he can be flying through Gotham desperately trying to stop Ra's al Ghul, why shouldn't a stuntman be able to do that? Why shouldn't he be able to really film that? And why shouldn't we be able to really be able to believe it? Bruce, why do we fall? The third act of Batman Begins is where all of this, the filmmaking, the themes of fear, and Bruce's journey beautifully culminate into a demonic nightmare where all of those things are amped up to 11. Throughout the entirety of the film, Alfred and by extension, Nolan, critique and question the moral righteousness of Batman, of Bruce Wayne. Every freaking week, some genius throws out the idea that Batman would be better off serving and helping the people as Bruce Wayne, using his wealth and influence to reform and fix the broken broken system. They act like it's their sole unique idea that Batman is really an ego-driven monster Bruce uses to get away with beating up poor people. Yeah, that's real smart. How's that degree in Batman working out for you? It's almost like that's the major critique of Batman and a good chunk of his stories, including this one. I'm using this monster to help other people just like my father did. But Thomas Wayne helping others wasn't about proving anything to anyone including himself. It's almost like his parents spent their entire lives trying to do just that, trying to save Gotham with their money and with their empathy, and it didn't work. In fact, they were guns down by one of the very people they were trying to help. It's almost like in order to make real change in a city like Gotham, you have to become a symbol. It's almost like in order to become that symbol, the Wayne name has to be burned to the ground. It's almost like Bruce realizes all of this, but chooses to side with the people. Obviously standing where I belong, between you and the people of Gotham. And finally, it's almost like he himself questions the validity of his mission. I wanted to save Gotham, but I failed. Why do we fall, sir? So that we can learn to pick ourselves up. You still haven't given up on me. Never.
Gotham has always been hell, but that chaos, the fear, was tucked away, hidden by the corrupt police and politicians in power, kept at bay by the Waynes, buried beneath the surface in the water and the pipes, but now Raish has unleashed all that fear. Literally, he has boiled it to the surface and into the sky. I'm always saying that the threat in a climax can't just be mindless drones. The set pieces can't just be barren green screen landscapes. The best climaxes should be a physical representation of the hero's internal conflict. If fear is the major part of that conflict, what better threat is there than the Scarecrow's gas erupting like a volcano all over Gotham? If the Wayne legacy is the other half of that, what better external location to have the final fight take place in than his father's train? His father's legacy speeding towards Wayne Tower. <laughs> The climax isn't just about Bruce saving the day. It's not about him in a fist fight with Raish. It's about Bruce becoming his own man, fully growing into the man he was destined to become after that night in the alley. Don't be afraid. Becoming his own man and letting go of living up to his father's legacy, both his fathers. Don't be afraid, Bruce. Letting that legacy crash and burn. You were just an ordinary man and a cape. That's why you couldn't fight injustice, and that's why you can't stop this train. Who said anything about stopping it? And trusting in the ordinary man, the good men, the men that Raish neglects. The humans left in Gotham who are not afraid. You never learned to mind your surroundings. And by doing that, Bruce is no longer afraid. He's no longer that scared little boy, that scared man with a gun. He is sure in his beliefs. He no longer needs to question what his father would want him to do. The white legacy is more than bricks and mortar, sir. And he no longer needs the vengeful, apathetic ideology of race. I won't kill you. But I don't have to save you. He lets Raish destroy himself, destroy the legacy of the League of Shadows, destroy their reign of fear and terror. He doesn't save him, and while that may be stretching that no-killing philosophy just a tad... I think it's completely in line with the man Bruce has become over the course of Begins. A man who has overcome his fear, became his fear, and became his trauma. A man who can now board up that trauma. put it where it belongs and start to rebuild his family's legacy. Rebuild it? Just the way it was, brick for brick. Or maybe... Just the way it was, sir? Yeah, why? I thought this might be a good opportunity for uh, improving the foundations in the southeast corner. The legacy of Thomas and Martha's selflessness and humanism lives on, but Bruce can improve the foundations of that legacy. Not in Bruce Wayne, but in... Nice. Every action has consequences. Every choice has weight. For every Batman, there will be a Joker, but at the end of the day, Gotham needs its dark knight. It needs this terrifying symbol of hope. A man who has the will to stand by and protect the people, protect the city that has taken so much from him. I never said thank you. A Batman that doesn't ask for recognition or praise or light. And you'll never have to. But a Batman who only asks that you look to the sky and think before you take. Think before you prey on those who are fearful, who are desperate. A Batman that is entirely faithful to the beloved icon, but is given an added layer by being the unique vision of an artist who is just getting started. A vision that started in Christopher Nolan's damn garage was conceived in that garage. They would work on the script, producers would come over and read the script, they built models next to the laundry machines, built parts of Gotham, parts of the Tumblr, entire sections of the movie were born in that damn garage. And I think that garage, like Batman, is kind of a symbol. A symbol of the approach Nolan and WB took. A symbol of the reason why Batman Begins is Batman fucking begins. Is the film that changed superhero films, blockbuster filmmaking, and kind of just Hollywood in general. Why did Warner Brothers get greedy, fail, fall, so they could learn to pick themselves up? 
Batman Begins is that damn garage. It's Christopher Nolan's. It belongs to him. It's him and his collaborators sweating in the hot summer heat, creating a universe and a take on the Cape Crusader with complete freedom and with complete trust. It's Christopher Nolan working on a giant studio picture with his friends and injecting it with the same thought, love, and care that he would back when he was 27. Back when he was making a small black and white independent film that cost 6,000 bucks. It's Christopher Nolan and changing the game, shifting the landscape, and evolving Batman by making the best Batman movie he could make, the best superhero movie he could create, and doing it all his way. As I sit here, having just finished the film, I'm extremely happy with what I've been able to do in my terms. That is to say, I've made the film that I said I was going to make. I've made it in the way that I wanted to make it. I've availed myself of all kinds of extraordinarily dedicated and creative collaborators, and ultimately they've helped me to make the film the way I felt it should be made. There isn't a frame of the film that I don't claim as my own, and that's, uh, that's very satisfying from a creative point of view.